Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Welcome everyone to our church, all of our guests and family who've traveled in town. Thank you for making time for, for God this morning and to be with your family to worship the, the reason for our season. And we've been in a series called The Wonder of Christmas. And two weeks ago, I started off with the wonder of his word and how the word of God is true and, and has come true and has been true all along. And we can trust God's word, amen? And then we learned last week that uh, the wonder of his hands, that God has worked out all things for us for our good. How many believe that? Amen. amen. We learned last week that we are in his hands. We're in good hands and that we're gonna be okay and his hands are upon us and that God orchestrates everything. And he's the great composer of Christmas. He composed this amazing birth of Christ so that we could be saved. And lastly, I wanna share with you the wonder of his love this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter two. We're gonna be in starting in verse one, Luke two. We'll also have it on the screen for you as well. Luke chapter two, we were in Matthew two last week. We find ourselves in Luke two today. As we read this, you'll see God's word working. We'll see God's hand guiding the shepherds and we'll see God reveal his love in the manger. Luke chapter two, verse one, at that time the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged and was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging or room available for them. What we see here already in the beginning of our story in Luke is Luke is highlighting the fact that a census was being taken to gather the people, you ready for this? For taxes. And so everyone needed to go back to their hometown to accurately have this list for taxing. And it just so happens that Joseph is from the line of David and he was also from Bethlehem. Now this was important to fulfill scripture in Micah 5 too, that scripture be fulfilled that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. This is also important that prophecy be fulfilled hundreds of years before that a ruler from the line of David would rule forever on the throne. And we know that ruler to be Jesus. So here we have God's hand and God's word working already. Prophetic word being fulfilled and God's hand leading and guiding the shepherds to go, uh, or the uh, Joseph and Mary to go back home for this census so that Jesus would fulfill scripture once again. And so they're there and we see the most simplest birth. There's only one line and it's basically this, Jesus is wrapped snugly in cloths and lying in a manger. That is the simple phrase of Christmas in one sentence. But it's, it's for a reason. Jesus came into this, this world as a king, but the most humblest king, didn't he? I'm fascinated by the fact that here we have the king of the universe, the Lord of the universe, and yet Jesus comes in the simplest, humblest form and accomplishes more than all kings combined on earth. Praise God for that. So let's keep reading forward and learn about the shepherds and the angels. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. Think about that for a moment, wow. They were terrified, 
But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, notice the three titles, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, second title, the Lord, the third title, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Amen. And once again, the word of God. The shepherds, the theme of humility continues. They were the lowest of the social class at that time. They were seldom in the know of the town chatter because they were always outside the town taking care of sheep. This time, the king of the universe would be revealed to them first. This time, the shepherds would get the in the know first. Isn't that cool? They would find out what's happening. They would be the one to tell the whole town what's actually going on in Bethlehem. The angel of the Lord's announcement is interesting. The wonder of God's word, sending an angel to make the most important announcement to the least expected. This angelic announcement is the inspiration for many songs and carols that we sing like Hark the Herald Angels Sing. The Savior, the Messiah, the Lord is born to you. The Savior means the Savior for our sins. The Messiah means the anointed one to rule and reign. And the word Lord is used for Israel's God, Yahweh, in the Greek translation. In other words, speaking of Jesus' divine nature, that he is God in the flesh, he has come from God. Jesus is therefore the savior of your sin and my sin, the ruler of our lives, and he is the son of God, he is God with us. That is good news, my friends. And that is exactly what they announced. And the angel said, there will be a peculiar sign. You will find this babe wrapped in swallowing clothes or snugly strips of cloth, lying in a manger, which is a feeding trough for animals. How interesting that would be to be shepherds to go and see a trough with a baby in it. It would be the only sign, it would probably be the only baby born that night and found in a feeding trough, would you agree? So it should be pretty easy. And the town of Bethlehem was small. There's more to that, and I'm gonna get to that in a moment. But then suddenly, a vast host of angels appear to join, to join in on this angel's announcement. And, and why? Well, usually there would be a parade in the town, but there was no human parade. There was no human reception for the birth of Jesus Christ. The world did not receive him as we should. The world was still learning that he was coming. So what did God do? God provided God's hands in the story, once again, the wonder of his hands. God provided a vast host, thousands of angels to show up, to be the parade, to be the reception for Jesus' coming. Amen? Amen. And now we join in with the angels and we sing out to him, Gloria, Gloria in the highest. Now we sing with them. The shepherds decide they better go see what's going on. Isn't that neat when God gets your attention? when God compels you and pulls you in. And so here they are compelled to go see what's actually happening. This must have occurred because they, they ran immediately to go find and look for the sign of Jesus. Not much is said about their moment visiting Jesus. By the way, they didn't shower before they went. <laughs> so who knows what that was like. <laughs> They didn't bring gifts, they just brought themselves. They left the stable and they told everyone everything that had happened. All those who heard were astonished. 
The shepherds returned their flocks, glorifying and praising God. It was just as the angel said. How can we learn from this? What can we take from this beautiful Christmas night story, the birth of Christ? Number one, Jesus came for all, so all may know and come to him. Jesus came for all, so all may know and come to him. The fact that Jesus was born in such a way as this is a wonder in itself, isn't it? The king and lord of the universe had come to a little town without room or lodging for him or his family. An animal troth instead of a crib, a bed of hay instead of a bed of fine linen. No city reception or extravagant welcome, but God provided one for them through the host of angels. The humble shepherds of the day were graced with the opportunity to be the first to go and see this child, the Messiah. And as I said before, they did not shower. They did not change into Sunday's best, and they didn't even bring gifts. The shepherds were captivated and intrigued by the unforgettable angelic announcement and vast army of angels. The wonder of heaven compelled them to go. Look for this newborn with the help of this special sign. You will see the Messiah lying in a feeding trough. Jesus would be first, Jesus would first be known to the humble and lowest of social class. As we learned last week, he would later be visited by the prestige of Gentile magi from the upper class. But what's the point here? Certainly, Jesus does not measure you by your physical class, but by your spiritual need for him. Scripture is clear. All have sinned and all need a savior. My friends, it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have, how much money you have. We're all in poverty because of our sin. We're all in debt because of our sin. But thank the Lord, the Savior came to pay for that debt. Thank the Lord. Secondly, we can take from this the wonder of God's love for you. The wonder of God's love for you. There's, there's something deeper going on be, below the surface with the manger and the shepherds. You need to, need to know this, that Bethlehem in Hebrew means house of bread. Jesus called himself in the book of John, the bread of life. And wheat and barley grew on the east side of Bethlehem. And where there is wheat, there are animals, right? Maybe crackers, who knows? <laughs> on the northwest side, there are sheep to feed on all this wheat. In Arabic, Bethlehem also is known as the house of meat. Bethlehem was synonymous with lambs ready for slaughter and sacrifice. Shepherds in Bethlehem were tending sheep destined for the temple to be sacrificed. Bethlehem is only about six miles away from Jerusalem, about a two hour walk. And guess what the temple needed? A lot of sheep, lambs. Two lambs were required every day for sacrifice in the temple. That would be 730 lambs a year. On top of that, the Passover required thousands of lambs every year for, and, and for other religious rituals for all the families. So the shepherds had to be particular about the lambs they chose for slaughter. So think about this for a moment. The angels say, you'll find this baby in a manger. This would be familiar to them because this is what the shepherds would do. To prevent harm and self-injury from thrashing about after birth on their spindly legs, newborn lambs were wrapped in swaddling clothes. This is true. So shepherds would take newborn lambs and they would wrap them in those cloths and put them in a trough or a manger so they can inspect, where they could calm down out of harm's way anything that might hurt the lamb. After careful inspection by the shepherd, any spot or blemish, no matter how slight, meant instant rejection. In other words, those who had spots were not used for sacrifices. Those who had blemishes were not used. It had to be a perfect lamb to be sent for sacrifice. It's the shepherds who gathered around the Bethlehem stable where the Lamb of God was born were not witnessing anything new except who was in the manger. 
the most important sacrificial lamb who had ever been born, the lamb who had closed down the slaughterhouse of sacrifice, the perfect lamb of God. They were witnessing God's love, God's sacrifice, his sacrificial love in the manger. What about the blood of lambs? We know scripture is clear on this about the need for the blood of Jesus Christ, amen? Female sheep or ewes and lamb mortality rates were high during this time. It was not uncommon for up to 30 to 40% of the lamb flock to die between late pregnancy and weaning. Female sheep are known for not adopting orphan sheep. Shepherds learned some methods to get a mother sheep to adopt an orphan lamb. One is to take the mother's placental blood and fluids and smear the orphan lamb with her smell. Hopefully that the, the ewe, the female lamb, would take on that lamb and adopt it. It didn't always work though. What works best is, and requires the most work is to wash the orphan lamb in the blood of a dead lamb related to that mother lamb. Historians believe that Jesus was crucified at 3 p.m., which is the same time the last sacrifice was offered on the day of Jewish Passover. The time the slaughter, the last lamb of the day at three o'clock. Jesus died when he did to show the Jews he was the lamb, the last sacrifice, the pardon and payment for their sins. Colossians 1, 19 through 20 says this, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once, once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You see, my friends and guests in church, we can't separate the birth of Christ from the cross of Christ because it's all part of God's story to redeem and save those who believe in Jesus. The angels declared that night, a savior is born and peace on earth to those whom his favor rests. The wonder of Christmas is Jesus. The wonder of God's love is Jesus. This is why when John the Baptist saw Jesus approaching him, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Are you seeing the culminating moment here? The foreshadowing of what's going on. When the shepherds were to visit this manger, they were seeing the future Lamb of God who would take away your sin and my sin and the sins of the whole world. The love of God on Christmas night was in a little manger. So it begs us to make room for him. That night there was no physical room. Do you know that the place that he was born was most likely a cave in the side of a cliff of a hill or a mountain? It wasn't pretty. It didn't smell good. He was surrounded by animals and yet Jesus was born there. The call for us is to make room. Think about this for a moment if we're talking about the wonder of his love. He came all the way from heaven to save you. He left the comforts of his kingdom and his throne to be born in an animal stable, to die on a cross, to go to a grave. But praise God, three days later, he rose again. So we can have eternal life, amen. I'm gonna have a stand. You can have your candles ready too as well. I wanna give us a chance to, response, uh, to respond and have a response time to this beautiful love that God has shown us. And if you can't stand physically, that's quite all right. Make room for him is my third point. Make room for him. Oh, don't light those candles yet, my friends. Do not light those candles yet. You will have wax all over you. 
All right, hold off on this candle lighting back there, all right? We can know God's love. The world can know about God's love, but it doesn't mean they experience God's love. Now, God put this on my heart to say, and I need to say it today. God wants you to experience his love in a transformative way, not just a knowledge way. Because we can sing songs that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But it doesn't mean it goes from here or your mind to your heart and changes the way you live. God wants you to know and experience his love through a relationship with him. By Jesus coming to earth, we know, we now know how to have a personal and loving relationship with God. Think about that. The son of God came to show us how to have a relationship with God and he made a way to pay for the sins so that we could be reconciled and brought back to a close relationship because sin separated us from God and now Jesus bridges us back to him. This is the love and the wonder of his love. God declares our need for Jesus right away at his birth. God makes it plain and simple. Jesus came to save us from our sins. People don't like to hear that word sin, but angels said it, prophets said it, God saying it. Sin keeps us from a relationship with him and only Jesus can bridge the gap to be with him to be with the Lord. The birth of Christ is God's plan to bring a love that corrects what has been broken, to help us see our need for him and to turn away from our way of thinking and living. And to believe in this truth, to believe in this good news, which we call the gospel, to believe in this is to let his love save us from sin and death. So it's not just a intellectual belief or a thought belief. It's a belief that you will allow him, that you believe what he did for you and you will allow him to change you, to, to repent of your way of living and take on the, the way of life that Jesus has for us. Are you following me? Amen. Because many people believe, if I just believe that God exists, if I just believe that Jesus did what he did for me, then I am saved. But that faith also has a surrender to it. That faith says, I surrender my, my old way of life and I take on the new way of life. And thank the Lord Jesus lived. Herod was not able to kill Jesus. We learned last week that he escaped Herod's threats of, of being killed and he was spared so that he could, he could live and show us how to live for God. And so... It, if, friends, if you don't make a decision today to believe in Jesus, at least do this. At least read about the life of Jesus. Look what he did and how he lived and what he taught. If you don't make a decision in this service, at least read the Bible, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and read about what Jesus did and how he lived for you. This Christmas message and the birth of Christ, it compels us to do something. We must be honest with ourselves and God by acknowledging that we need salvation from sin and death through Jesus Christ. This is what's beautiful about salvation. It's not just salvation from sin, but it's salvation from eternal death because the gift of God is eternal life. What a beautiful gift. Every believer in this room started at this point. We acknowledge that we needed Jesus. All of us have done that. And to be a Christian is to be a child of God, to be like Jesus. God's word in Emmanuel, which means Jesus, teaches us how to love God and live like him. And we're gonna sing in a moment, O Holy Night, as a song of worship to him. But if you need to make a decision right now to receive the wonder of his love, to receive Jesus Christ. I wanna encourage you to do that. Can we all close our eyes? And let's just pray for a moment. I thank God for this season. I thank God for your plans and all the time you're gonna to spend together with family or friends or the things you have going on, but nothing matters more right now than an eternal decision with the Lord, amen? 
Would you make room for him today? He came all the way from heaven because he sees you. And he sees what you've been going through. He sees your need for him. He knows. And he's been working on your heart to receive him. Would you believe in him today? Would you take him as your Lord and Savior from sin and death and receive eternal life? That sounds like good news, doesn't it? And you can do that by saying a simple prayer like this, dear Jesus, and you can say it with me right now, dear Jesus, I see my need for you. I confess my sin and that you are my Lord and my Savior. Change me on the inside. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live a new life for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Can we pray? We just thank God for right now for what he's done in this place. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for you changing lives today, changing hearts. We thank you, Lord. Friends, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or maybe you're recommitting your life, there are cards in the pews that look just like this that can tell us about that. We would love to connect with you and to send you resources to help you on your journey. There's also free Bibles in your pews that are the ones that are colored. If you need a Bible to read about the life of Jesus, please take one. We'll fill it up this week. So we have one more takeaway. One more. The shepherds left and they told everyone the good news. What a great response. Spread his love to all. Not just during the Christmas season, but because God's love has changed you, love everyone you can around you, amen? amen. The shepherds didn't bring Jesus gifts, but that's okay because what they did is they sought him. They were seeking him and they were being in his presence and that's exactly what God wants. God wants you to be in his presence and the glory of that night and the time with Jesus stirred an awe and wonder that overflowed into praise and witness to everyone around them. In other words, that encounter was so powerful they couldn't keep the good news in. What an appropriate response for us today. And every day is an opportunity to seek Jesus and every day is an opportunity to show the love of Jesus to everyone around us, amen? Between all humanity, think about this for a moment in closing. Between all humanity and eternal death was the manger, was the cross, and was the grave. Seems like an unlikely victory, doesn't it? Wait, a manger is keeping me from eternal death? What's that going to do? A cross where someone's killed on, that's going to keep me from eternal death? A grave, that's where, that's where dead people are. How is that gonna save me from sin and death? But, oh my friends, that's the wonder of God's word. That's the wonder of God's hands and that's the wonder of his love. God worked out our salvation and our redemption by his plans, wisdom and love, not our plans. Not in ways that we think, not our thoughts, but his thoughts. The birth of Jesus was the inauguration of God's rescue plan and began in the unlikeliest place. That's the wonder of God, and Jesus is the wonder of his love.